Hey, this is Natalie Hoffman with FlyingFreeNow.com and right now I'm recording this live on Facebook. Hello to those of you who are coming in and um, for those of you who are watching later on YouTube, hello to you as well. So today I have a lot of thoughts. Um, I'm not going to, for those of you who are watch the replays on YouTube, I did not upload my two lives from last week because they were mostly just me processing a very painful situation that was happening in my life and I was on vacation last week and so I had time to just kind of process that. So we're going to leave all of that behind and we're going to start fresh. I'm at home now. Um, I am in my own bed. My back is healing and everything is um, feeling much better about life. So I want to talk about this book though that I bought right before I went on vacation and I should not have purchased, I bought the book for Audible and I shouldn't have done that. Uh, I was talking to a friend last night and she was saying, yeah, don't buy like self-help books or psychology books or whatever on Audible. Just buy stories on Audible. And usually that's what I do. But for some reason, I bought this book on Audible. I think I was thinking I was going to listen to it on the way to um, my, uh, our trip to Wisconsin. And um, it just turned out that it's just not that kind of book. It's called Loving What Is by Byron Katie. And I have not finished it, but I wanted to kind of process a little bit about what I'm learning in that book. Now, and you know, you're, you're maybe wondering, well, do you recommend that book? I'm not really sure. I'm learning a lot and I, I do recommend it if you are ready to kind of stretch your thinking in some ways. Um, but if you are a really raw survivor, like still in the thick of the stuff in your life, this book could be kind of triggering for you. Um, and the reason is because, well, here's, here's kind of her whole concept, I think, or her whole idea is that we think with our prefrontal cortex and we solve problems with this part of it. Okay. But when we are in constant, our amygdala or a primitive brain, which is in the, at the base of our skull, that is the part of our brain. It's kind of like the toddler brain. All it cares about is I'm if you're going to die or not. Okay. So it does not like to feel bad feelings. It does. And it likes to feel good feelings. And if it feels anything bad, it just starts jumping up and down and screaming, you're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. And then that affects your whole nervous system and your body gets all whacked out. And then your prefrontal cortex, if it's bad enough, your prefrontal cortex will actually shut down so that you're no longer able to think logically or think rationally about an issue that you're dealing with. So her whole thing is that, and here's the other thing too, your amygdala doesn't, I just got a notification saying flying free is live right now. Hello. The amygdala, the amygdala doesn't know the difference between reality, like a, a, a tiger chasing you and killing you and what your tell it, what your thoughts are, the stories that you're telling yourself. Okay. Your amygdala just believes that if it's a bad feeling, if you feel scared, that you are going to die and that you need to either freeze or you need to run away or you need to get ready to fight. All right, so that's great. That's all well and good if we're, t if we're in a car accident, if we're dealing with an emergency situation, but it's not so good. For example, I'll just give you an example in my own life. When your kids come home, from being with their dad and then they want to talk about their experiences there. And my amygdala is, and I've got stories that have been looping in my brain for years and years and years. All those, all of that is activated. My amygdala says, you're going to die. You're going to die. And then my prefrontal cortex is not able to think logically and it shuts down. I'm getting better at this, but I'm just giving you an, a real example that a lot of us deal with. The fact is that we're not going to die. Our kids are most likely not going to die in most of the situations that we're dealing with. If, if you are thinking that you're in danger, then this conversation is not about what's going on in your life. Okay. So, um, Byron, one of the things that Byron Katie says is, uh, she doesn't like to suffer. So she doesn't argue with reality. She said, and this is a quote, I realized that it's insane to oppose it, meaning reality. When I argue with reality, I lose, but only 100% of the time. And I love that because that's one of the things that we do in the Flying Free group is I try to help women, first of all, ex wake up to reality 
th that's really kind of what my book is. Is it me is about waking up to the reality. And then the flying free group is about learning how to live in that reality to accept it as reality instead of fighting it. And then awaken our prefrontal cortexes so that we can start doing things based on reality rather than based on wishful thinking, based on what we hope will happen in the future, based on miracles and imaginations and all of that other stuff, okay? All right, so I wanna read to you a, something I found online. Um, it's from a website called experiencelife.com and he's he or she, I don't know who it is, is talking about um, this book, and Byron Katie's whole concept, which she calls the work. And the work is basically, well, here, I'll just read this. Um, the question remains, of course, how can you get to a point where you actually love what is? Okay, you love what is right now. That's the name of her book, Loving What Is, which is fascinating to me, and that's why I got the book. Um, Especially when the reality is that your lover left you, or you got fired, or you found out that you have cancer. Katie has an answer. It, notice it doesn't say the answer, it just says an answer, okay, which is, I, have, I think, helpful. And she calls it the work. The work is a process that involves writing down troubling thoughts and then asking four simple questions. Number one, is it true? Number two, can I absolutely know that it's true? Number three, how do I react when I think that thought? And number four, who would I be without that thought? If you want, you can actually go to thework.com and she has these worksheets that I highly recommend that you go and try them out just for the fun of it. It's fascinating. And um, I'm going to give you an example of, the, I'll, I'll give you an example from my own life, okay? It's not that, it's not that profound or anything, but it will help you out a little bit. All right, so the whole exercise, if you go there and do it, is designed to reveal how our deepest beliefs are often based in misunderstanding. Now, this is where the, this is the point of triggering for survivors, okay? Because I can read that knowing what I know from my past and I can say, well, I, that's what made me stay in my relationship is I just kept thinking, well, maybe I'm just misunderstanding everything. Maybe I'm just not seeing things the way, you know, maybe I'm just like, maybe I really am delusional. Like these people say that I am. Maybe I really am crazy. Maybe I really do have, you know, some problems with my personality. Maybe I, what, you know, and fill in the blank. Okay, so then what I would do and what I've discovered about my own self and maybe and I really think a lot of I mean, a lot of what I write and say is just from my own experience. And then all of these people come out of the woodwork and they're like, yeah, I feel the same way. So I know I'm not the only one that feels this way. So. Um, but. Oh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Oh my gosh, I totally lost my train of thought. I hate that when that happens. My prefrontal cortex just went, so something must be triggering my little amygdala. Anyways, or it could just be that I'm getting old. Um, maybe it'll come back to me, but let me go back to my notes here because that might jog my memory too. Um, so basically what she says is that we should question our beliefs, okay? Every thought, she, this is her quote, every thought, every person, Every apparent problem is here for the sake of your freedom. Now that I can buy into. Like I love to be able to think that all of the things that I went through in my past were there on purpose to shape me into who I am now and to actually secure my ultimate freedom. Because really our freedom, where we're really enslaved is inside of ourselves. We enslave ourselves by our belief systems. Now, you might be at a place in your life where you are enslaved by your belief that, for example, a lot of women that I talk to are enslaved by their belief that divorce is always wrong no matter what. And so they feel like they need to stay married 
to their partner even though he's abusive because divorce is always wrong that's their belief they're enslaved not in reality are they enslaved because people get divorced all the time and Christians get divorced all the time but they're they're enslaved by their belief that they must not maybe they believe that the consequences are that their children will all go to hell that they'll go to hell that they'll get kicked out of their church <gasps> that actually happened to me so that can happen that you know that all of these things can happen and though then that will be so far worse than living in an abusive marriage and that's their belief that could be your belief if you're listening to this and the, and i just and so what katie byron katie wants I, I want to call her Katie because I have a daughter named Katie and I don't, well, I actually do know someone named Byron, but it's a guy. Anyway, um, so Byron Katie, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I go off on these stupid tangents. She um, wants to bring you to the place where you can recognize that some of your beliefs are not actually rooted in reality. Some of them are, but some of them aren't. So let's take a look. Let's take a closer look at them. And that's what she calls the work. Okay. So one of her, um, one of her big ideas is that, and I, and this is one of my big ideas too. And I didn't even get it from her. I've just, you know, I, I've just learned this. It's, and she says, she calls it just minding your own business. Okay. Just mind your own business. And we're so good as parents. If you're a parent or a mom, we're so good at like, we understand that and get it when it comes to teaching our kids to mind their own business. No, that's not your business. You're not, you don't need to get into your sister's business. Your business is over here. If you just kept, kept, uh, you know, your side of the block. Okay. Then your sister or brother could keep their side of the block just fine. But you're always in each other's business. You don't take responsibility for your stuff. You take all the responsibility for his stuff or her stuff, and then it just gets all messed up. So the key to that is just keep to your side of the block and mind your own business. All right. It's easy for us as moms to see. Yeah. Oh, we totally get that. But when it comes to our marriages or our relationships with our family of origin or our relationships with our, some of our friends, then we don't get it. Like their business is our business because we care right? We care. We care about our spouse. We care about our friend. We care about our family member. And so we're going to just get right in there with them in their business and let them know what we need them to change. But often what we want them to change is just so that we can feel better about ourselves. Like we want them to change. We don't want them to say those same things that they always say because it makes us feel crappy. And I'm not talking about someone who's swearing at you and telling you blah, 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 blah. That would make anybody feel crappy. Okay. I'm talking about just the way sometimes personalities are just the way they are and they can be really annoying. All right. So, and we tell stories to ourselves about the, these things that are happening in our lives in order to help us cope and make sense and feel better because we're all about feeling good human. I'm sorry, but human beings are all about feeling better. We run towards things that make us feel better. We do things that make us feel better and we run away from things that make us feel worse. All right, so here, um, here's, oh, and she also says, uh, she stresses the fact that there are three kinds of business. There's my business, there's your business, and then there's God's business. And suffering happens when we get out of our own business and into someone else's business, including God's. So I really, that resonated with me. I really, I feel good about that. I feel like yeah, that resonates with my life experience. That resonates with what I believe in my internal values. Okay. So here's, um, I'm just going to run this through with you. Um, so do this. Okay. Get out a piece of paper or you can do this in your mind. And, and this is what you'll find in the worksheets. I just think this is kind of fun. So I complain about fill in the blank because fill in the blank. So think about that. I complain about what? Something should come to your mind right away that maybe you've been complaining about. My guess is that all of us have complained about something in our heads since we woke up this morning. So I complain about this because, and then write down why. All right, then what we're going to do, so here's mine, okay? And I hope, I, hope, uh, I hope this is okay to say in public, but I complain about my ex because he doesn't respond. That was my sentence that I picked, okay? So just pick a random sentence and do this exercise with me. Then what you're going to do is you're going to drop the words, I complain and because, and you're just going to turn it into a one-liner. So instead of, I complain about my ex because he doesn't respond, I would turn that into, my ex doesn't respond, 
Okay. So do that with your sentence. Isn't this fun? Are we having fun yet? All right. Then you want to ask the, you want, well, first of all, she says she wants you to stop and think about that statement and think about what comes up for you. Now I'm not going to do this here in front of you guys because you know, it's kind of personal, but my ex doesn't respond. I would sit and I would think about that. My ex doesn't respond. And I might have a lot of feelings that come up, like feelings of frustration, lots of old stories, lots of past experience, lots of like, why can't this change? And what can I do to make this change? Lots of stuff is going to come up for me. And lots of stuff is going to come up for you with your sentence. Then you ask the first question, is this true? Is it true? Okay, my ex doesn't respond. I would say, yes, I probably, this is me. I'd probably say, yes, it's true. He doesn't respond. Okay, question two. Can you absolutely know that it is true? Well, not really. Because actually he does respond sometimes. And he may have responded, but just not responded to me. Um... And so, so no, I guess I can't really say that it's absolutely true. All right. Now you might be able to say that yours absolutely is true. Okay. But question three, how do you react and what happens when you believe that thought? Now I just kind of described to you a little bit about how I react when I think of that thought. What emotions arise? For me, it's frustration, it's hopelessness, it's I'm gonna be doing this crap for the rest of my life, it's why can't he just grow up, you know, it's all of that stuff, okay? What images of the past or future do you see when you believe that thought? I see lots and lots of images of the past and the future, like lots of stuff, okay? Just from that, it's, isn't this incredibly fascinating? That one sentence, and when you stop and think, that that's just one sentence that your brain is looping on? That there's a millions more in there? Oh, I'm just sweating like a pig. You guys, our, our air conditioning doesn't work. And it, we're in Minnesota, but it's still hot up here in Minnesota right now. So, um, and I'm in the basement and I'm sweating like crazy. All right. Um, so, okay. And then how do you treat yourself and others when you believe that thought? So here's what I, what I said. I panic. I feel like I need to get a little louder. Like he's not responding. When someone doesn't respond to me, I feel dismissed and um, ignored. I try to, I remember being ignored and dismissed as a child. So that comes up for me. And I'm afraid of the same thing happening to my kids. And I'm also afraid of it happening to me, like continuing to happen to me. And so I go on the defensive and I either, my, my knee jerk is to fight, that's what I am, but I also do run and hide as well. So depending on the situation, I'll do one or the other. And so, um, okay, so that was my answer. So you'd, you'd answer that question. How do you react and what happens when you believe that thought? Um, and then the fourth question is this, who or what would you be without that thought? Like if I could get rid of that thought and never have that thought again, who would I be? Oh my gosh, I love that. Like the, just the thought of not having that thought makes me feel better. It makes me feel oh, relaxed, okay? And I think that I would be at peace. I think that I would live out of a state of love instead of fear. And I would, like I just said, I would relax. All right, then she's got this second part and it's called the turnarounds. So once you go through the, that particular worksheet, then you go to these turnarounds and you turn the thought around. This is where I'm telling you, if you're a survivor in the raw, this can get very, very tricky. But if you are ready to, <clears throat> to go badass and you really want to dig deep into yourself um, and take personal responsibility, which I am at that place where I want to, I really want to, even if it hurts, okay, because I know I stand by everything I've written in my book and everything I do in my program. I stand by it. I stand by victims. I believe them. Oh, that's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say earlier when I, when I lost my train of thought. One of my big breakthroughs just in the last, I, I'm serious, in the last seven days is that I believe everything everybody says. I believe everything that I think 
and say, and I believe everything that everyone else says. And that sounds so good, right? It sounds like, oh, you know what? Like she's, she'll just believe everything. Like on the one hand, that's really good because someone can tell me something and I'm going to believe it. I'm just going to believe, I'm just going to take you at face value and believe what you're saying. But on the other hand, how many of us are like that? And we've been told a crock of lies and we just believe it. We just take, or our kids will come up to us and say, I just want to die. I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And they're having all these emotional, you know, adolescent issues and we believe them and we start panicking. Oh my gosh, she's going to die. Okay. That's, that's what happens when you believe everything. So I think there's a balance. This is what I am trying to grow and evolve in. There's a balance between listening, being a good listener, and then actually just buying into everyone's stories. And this is why I think um, as a coach, I need to get better at this as a coach because when people come to me, they tell me their problems or they tell me an issue they want coaching on and I will believe everything they're saying. I'll be- and it's hard for me sometimes, that makes it hard for me to get behind what they're saying to help them get unstuck because what I'm doing is I'm jumping in the pool with them and I'm drowning with them. All right, so that's what I'm working on. And, um, and I'm working on that. At, when, when I had that epiphany this last week, I thought I'm gonna work on that with my kids and how I work with my kids. I'm gonna work with how I, that with how I work with my coaching clients and how I work with survivors. And, oh, and to, oh, to believe what they're saying, yes, to validate. Because from when they're, when they're sharing, their story of what's happened to them, when I think about my story of what's happened to me, that is very real for me. All of those things are very real. But some of them are, because I, I, some of them, like the idea that, um, you know, I can jump to these, and I, survivors do this all the time, we can jump to these conclusions, for example, that if our kids spend any time with their dad, that are that they're going to be destroyed for the rest of their lives. Now, in some cases, that may be, but for the vast majority of cases, that's probably not going to happen. My kids are not going to be destroyed for the rest of their lives because they have a relationship with their dad and they spend time with him. There's going to be some challenges there, but when I stop and think about it, when I've been doing this work on myself, I've realized, you know, they're going to have problems with lots of people in their lives. Um, And they have some problems with me too. It's not just their dad. They have problems with me also. And so that's part of life. That's part of the human experience. And I don't need to, my amygdala does not need to jump up and down and freak out and act like the whole, the sky is falling and my kids are all going to go to hell in a handbasket. That's not my job. And when I do that, I don't, the result in my life is that I'm not showing up in the way that I want to as a healthy whole person who's able to enter fully into loving my children where they're at, even loving my ex where he's at, not that loving him, I'm remarried, not that loving him means any more than just having a kind, benevolent feeling towards him, even when he's being, you know, himself. Um, But, okay, and I lost my turn of thought again. So let me go back to this. Um, Oh, so the only thing I wanted to say that the only caveat that I had then is if you are a survivor um, and you've been invalidated your whole life, this whole thing could actually knock you right back into invalidating yourself. And that is not what you want to do. What we do in the Flying Free group program is that we actually work on learning how to validate yourself, learning how to extract yourself from the universe of your abuser or other or other people who are trying to control you so that you can learn how to control your own life care about learn how to take care of really good care of yourself learn how to love yourself just the way you are and then you can um, be able to turn around and offer so much more to the world around you including to your kids your grandkids your friends and your family all right so um but again if you're up for some stretching i think this is a really good a book for a stretcher for deeper personal development. Um, so I think that if everyone did this work that she's talking about, and you know, when I, when I read these worksheets and stuff, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, so-and-so needs to do these worksheets. They need to do the work. And that person over there needs to do the work. But you know, the bottom line is that I actually need to do the work. I need to do the work and I'm ready to do the work because I want to take it to the next level. Um, Oh, 
so I was going to say, we, th we tend to think that, you know, if everyone did the work, then this world would be such a much sweeter place to live. And it actually would be, it actually would be. But then again, I think, well, even just that thought shows that I'm actually jumping into everybody else's business and I really just need to take care of myself. Because at the end of the day, I can't change the world. I can change one person and that's me. And I do believe that as I work on myself and change myself, that that will have a trickle effect. I can be an example to other people of what's possible for them as well. And that's what I want, all right? That's what I want. So I think also from a Christian standpoint, and then I'll be done, is that this is a glimpse of what it means when the Bible says that perfect love casts out fear. Because when we're operating with those kinds of thoughts, like my ex doesn't respond, what does that create in me? Does that create love inside of me? No, it creates tremendous amounts of fear inside of me. The reality is that my ex sometimes responds and sometimes doesn't, and it's very intermittent, and that was part of the control and the abuse cycle in my relationship with him but I don't want to live with that thought for the rest of my life because what it produces in me is fear and fear has no good result in the end. I want to exchange it for a thought that produces love in me. We miss the turnarounds. The turnarounds, I'm just going to have you go to thework.com and you can do the turnarounds, but the turnarounds, the turnaround thought is you take everything about that thought and you turn it around to the opposite. And it's kind of interesting. Like for, I'll just give you my example. So um, my ex doesn't respond. You could turn that around in two ways. You could say, I don't respond and try that thought on and see how it feels. And I, if I'm honest, if I'm gut level honest with myself and I want to be honest, I do respond, but I don't always respond in the way that I want to respond. I respond from my little toddler self instead of my adult self. And so in that way, I don't respond. Here's another turnaround. My ex does respond, my, or my ex responds. And so when I try that thought on, I'm thinking, um, you know, he does sometimes respond. And even in his non-response, he's responding, right? He's responding. He's letting me know through his behavior of not responding what he, you know, what he, where he's coming from. And that is a response in and of itself. So those are, those are ways that you can turn around. So go over to that page. I, I, it's just the work.com. And if you're interested in diving and doing a deep dive into this whole thing, and by the way, on that page, she has interviews with people where she actually does this whole process with them. So those are fascinating. And that'll give you a taste of what her book is like. And then if you're like, if this kind of stuff is fascinating to you, you can go and get her book, but don't buy it on Audible. If I had to do it all over again, I would have bought, bought it in a hard copy, not even Kindle, because I like for books like this, that, I, that I, you kind of work through things. They're more like work style books. I like to have a hard copy of those. So that's what I'd recommend to you. Um, but of course, do whatever works best for you. And that's all I have for you today. Let's see. I do have a question here. How about C does not respond the way I would like? Yeah. Well, and Carrie, that's true. I mean, it, someone cannot respond the way you like. And that actually feels better. Well, it does to me anyway. When I think he doesn't respond the way that I would like. That feels actually more true and feels more calming to me than that he doesn't respond. Because then what I do is I'm putting the responsibility back on him. Yeah, he doesn't respond the way I would like. And I'm also taking my own responsibility for my own feelings about what he's doing. Okay, so I love that. That was really good. The name of the book is um, Loving What Is by Byron Katie. I'm just going to see if there's any other questions before I go and I don't see any. So thank you so much for joining me and until next week, fly free.